Before I start this video today, I just want to give a very big thank you to my sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Forget everything you think you know about mobile games, because one of the most ambitious RPG projects of 2019 has been released, and it's going to change everything. Raid has all the features you'd expect from a brand new RPG title, like amazing storylines, awesome 3D graphics, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. So go to the description of this video now and download Raid only through my links to get 50,000 silver immediately and a free epic champion as part of the new player program, courtesy of the dev team. See you there. A few years back, you couldn't go a day online without hearing about Milo Yiannopoulos, an online political and social commentator that made headlines for his oftentimes absurd remarks. The thing is, you do not hear much from him anymore, despite being huge not too long ago, leading me to wonder what happened. Well, let's take a look at who this guy is and why he became popular in the first place to understand where he's at now. Milo started to become prominent in the early days of the anti-social justice warrior movement online. The tropes may be well established now, but back in 2015, people were just learning about crazed college students trying to ban free speech. This gave rise to many internet personalities who made a career making fun of these SJWs. The format for all these people, including Milo, was simple enough. They'd go around making fun of trigger warnings, microaggressions, and safe spaces on the internet. Next, they'd get invited to a liberal university by the small Republican or Libertarian student group on campus. When they'd show up to give the speech, a ton of raving college students would appear to protest them in over-the-top and ridiculous ways, which would then be recorded and uploaded online the next day for everyone to mock. You then repeat this process all over again. Online personalities like Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, Jordan Peterson, and Christina Hoff Summers were all those who really gained a lot of fans from the cycle, but none were quite as outrageous as Mr. Yiannopoulos. Milo would purposely say over-the-top things not because he actually believed it, but rather because he wanted to get people as angry as possible. This isn't just my opinion either. He openly admits to being a provocateur and troll with some ideology sprinkled in there that will inevitably get people upset. I mean, what better way is there to get protesters at your event than to go around saying feminism is worse than cancer? The other ingredient to his success is as a half-Jewish openly gay man, his protesters had a lot more trouble grouping him in with other cis white male scum. Because of this fact, many supported him just as they did any other anti-SJWs. They felt he counteracted their outrageous behavior with his own. The craziest part about his act is that the mainstream media really latched onto his antics, doing interviews with him all the time that increased his popularity. While everyone was furious at what he said, they kept on feeding the troll, providing the attention he needed to thrive. Milo would talk about a wide range of subjects, including homosexuality, gender, race, politics, and religion, all of which seemed to lead back to the central theme of getting people really mad, which worked all too well. To give an example of this, one thing that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way was when he took a picture of an obese person at the gym working out to shame him. Taking pictures of random people minding their own business is already not the the kindest thing you could do, but the added absurdity of mocking someone as they're in the process of trying to improve themselves is on a whole other level. This is a great example of the kind of shenanigan he thrived on, and his social media platform of choice to troll was Twitter. For a brief period of time, I followed his Twitter account, and I remember after a while I just couldn't take it anymore. It seemed like Milo just sat on there all day getting into arguments that were in no way constructive and draining to get involved with. I honestly don't know how anyone can be exposed to those cancerous back and forth political discussions that occur on Twitter without going insane. And if I was unable to stand observing it, I have no clue how you can be the one who's the center of the attention. The toxic loop of staying in the spotlight by getting in fight after fight lasted for a while but eventually his actions did have consequences. I'd say the first sign of Milo's downfall was his banning from Twitter, which was mainly attributed to the 2016 Ghostbusters fiasco. When the star of the movie Leslie Jones started to argue with people on Twitter, Milo and his fans jumped in and started mocking her. When Leslie appeared to have a breakdown over the trolling, Twitter got involved and banned his account. This led to the narrative that he was booted from the platform for criticizing a celebrity. In a recent episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey and a colleague explained the official reason why Milo was kicked off of the platform for good. The one that I like to uh, look at, which really convinced me, is he posted two doctored tweets that were supposedly by Leslie Jones. They were fake tweets. Um, the first one said, white people are getting on my nerves, like how can you call yourself human? And then the second one said, um, the goddamn uh, slur for a Jewish person 
Let so me. this was just a fake tweet that someone had photoshopped? Two there were fake, two, two, fake, two tweets. fake tweets. Whether you agree with their decision or not, there's no doubt that Milo was pushing the limits of what he could get away with on Twitter without the higher-ups banning him for years. But spreading libelous fake tweets from Leslie Jones seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Mainstream media publications started to write stories about how the tech giant was allowing this to go on and they finally did away with him. He by no means slowed down his antics after this, however, because all his other social media platforms were still up and running. He kept on going on news shows, doing events, and sharing his hot takes elsewhere on the internet. Of course, we all know if you keep on making absurd comments, eventually something will go too far. This occurred in 2017 when people started to spread a clip of him from the Drunken Peasants podcast where he defended the practice of adults having sexual relationships with minors. Even for people that liked his trolling, pedo comments seemed to have gone a bit too far and in result, his little empire started to come crashing down. It appears that he was forced to resign as a writer from Breitbart, had lost a $250,000 book deal, and events started to uninvite him from speaking. In response to all this, he wrote on Facebook, I've gone through worse, this will not defeat me. But it kinda did. After this huge falling out, I stopped hearing about the once prominent warrior against political correctness and it appears that I wasn't the only one. Reports from the end of 2018 claimed that he was $2 million in debt, including 400000 from billionaire Bob Mercer, who had been bankrolling his operation. When he tried to make a Patreon as a revenue stream to recoup some of that money, it was closed down soon after. The thing that most people don't know about a lot of these anti-SGW creators is that they're at least partially funded by billionaires to stay afloat. Dave Rubin has received money from the Koch brothers for his show, and Ben Shapiro the Daily Wire is at least partially owned by Dan and Ferris Wilkes. If they tick off the billionaires funding them, they could be in a lot of financial trouble just like Milo. When addressing the end of his backing for Mr. Yiannopoulos, I think Bob Mercer actually explained his downfall pretty well. I supported Milo Yiannopoulos in the hope and expectation that his expression of views contrary to the social mainstream and his spotlight of the hypocrisy of those who would close down free speech in the name of political correctness would promote the type of open debate and freedom of thought that is being throttled on many American college campuses today. But in my opinion, actions of and statements by Mr. Yiannopoulos have caused pain and divisiveness, undermining the open and productive discourse that I had hoped to facilitate. People went to Milo to counteract the craziness seen on college campuses. But as the old saying goes, you can't fight fire with fire. It may have been fun to watch a few SJW rage compilations he provided content for, but at the end of the day, people across the political landscape found him to be just too toxic and stopped feeding the troll. Recently, it was reported that the country of Australia rejected his ability to visit on grounds of character which might be a first for an online commentator. He still does have some fans on YouTube and Facebook, but the days of him being a serious force in politics appears to be over. Hey everybody, and thank you so much for making it to the end of this video today, it's really appreciated. And as for the question of the day, somebody wants to know how I personally feel about the new Pokemon Shield and Sword games. To be honest, I'm actually really disappointed. For years, people made the excuse for Game Freak that they were being held back by inferior software of the 3DS, DS, or the Game Boy systems. But now with the Nintendo Switch, they could do a whole full-fledged AAA Pokemon game. And what they come out with so far, it really just looks like a high-res 3DS game. Everything looks pretty linear. They're going back to the old format of having to go through grass to find Pokemon and doing one gym at a time. And it's just the same old game that people have been playing since the 90s. There's a little bit of a graphical improvement and a few new Pokemon here or there and a couple new features. But other than that, it's the same core game. If you're the kind of person who likes playing the same exact game every single time, these will probably be right up your alley. But as for somebody like me who's been playing these games for so long and has kind of gotten bored with them as the years have progressed, it's just really disappointing that they can't do better. Pokemon is the highest grossing franchise of all time. It beats out Harry Potter, it beats out Marvel, it beats out Star Wars even. Yet they really can't do much more with the games, it seems. Now if Game Freak can't do better than what they're doing right now, that's fine. They could keep on making these games. But at the bare minimum, just allow another studio to try to work on a new and fresh 
fresh experience. Maybe do something like Breath of the Wild did with the Zelda franchise. It's, it's just really frustrating to me and I hope that they could do better in the future. But as for right now, I'm just really disappointed. And that's a sad thing to say because I've been playing Pokemon since I was a little kid. So I'll end the video right there and until next time, thanks for watching.